Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you all for joining us and welcome to Conservation Conversations. Uh, my name is Ed Pritchard and I work for the Miami-Dade County Parks Department. This webinar uh, series is a joint effort between UF IFAS Extension, Florida Sea Grant, Miami-Dade County Parks and Miami Eco Adventures. For those that are new to this series, we welcome you and we thank you for taking the time tonight to participate uh, in our series. Uh, we do host these webinars every second Wednesday of the month featuring a different South Florida conservation topic. Our fall and winter season will wrap up next month where we're upon we will announce uh, the spring season's dates and topics. So before we get started, just a few housekeeping items. Uh, everyone in the webinar is currently muted and your videos are turned off. We ask that you remain that way and type any questions for tonight's presenter in the chat box. Uh, we will, uh, myself and my colleague Anna will moderate the chat and we will have time at the end uh, of the presentation to uh, pose those questions to our presenter. Uh, our reminder that this webinar is being recorded. We will send out that link to the recording within the next week. Um, and we also suggest that you follow us on social media. This is where we advertise uh, the upcoming webinars, as well as showcase related content. Uh, if you'd like to receive an email reminder with the conservation topic, uh, please email Anna via the email address she's going to put in the chat box. Um, and then that way you can stay up to date um, on what's coming up. So without further ado, I'm excited to uh, introduce tonight's presenter, Dalton Goolsby. Uh, Dalton, go ahead and take it away. Thanks, Ed. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining us tonight. Um, I'm excited that there's so many people, um, you know, wanting to learn about butterflies and butterfly gardening. Um, whether you know already something about butterflies or uh, you're just kind of getting into this, I hope you guys can all learn something and take it away from this presentation and maybe apply it to your own landscape. Um, real quickly, before we get into it, I'll just kind of get into what I do. Uh, I work for the U UF IFAS Extension Program. Basically, we take all of the research being done by the University of Florida, and we literally extend it to our communities. So my program, as you can see at the bottom right, is the Urban Horticulture Program. And uh, so here in Miami-Dade County, we deal with um, Florida-friendly landscaping, pollinator-friendly landscaping, um, water conservation, all kinds of nice friendly topics that you guys can apply at home and um, you know, help reduce our impact on you know, our fragile South Florida environment. I myself am a resident of Coral Gables in South Florida. so. I moved here about three years ago, and my coworker Barbara really got me into um, butterflies, and it's I've, I've gotten bit by the bug. So hopefully, you guys, the same happens with you tonight. Um, so we're going to go ahead and get into it. Butterflies in your backyard. Um, well, real quick before we start, I just want to say also that um, you know pollinators depend on us just as much as we depend on them for food. About uh, ninety percent of the world's flowering plants actually depend on pollinators to go to seed. Um, you know, I, I basically call pollinators the the Charles Darwin's of the natural world. They, they're they literally uh, executing evolution, you know, crossbreeding plants and pollen and things like that with uh, different pollens and things like that. Um, so they're, we need them, they feed us and uh, we can, you know, in the process of us building our homes, we're destroying their habitats. And um, the least we can do is, you know, plant a couple plants in our yards that will um, return some of this habitat to the butterflies. Uh, right now we're actually undergoing what some people are deeming a pollinator apocalypse where due to habitat fragmentation, climate change and habitat degradation, um, invertebrate pollinator species like butterflies, bees, moths and flies and other things like that, uh, species extinction rates are sometimes 100 to 1000 times higher than historical averages because of these interruptions. Um, so like I said, uh, hopefully today you guys can learn some plants you can plant in your yard that can you know bring the whole circle of life to your backyard and um just it, it, nothing's more special than having um you know butterflies the, the the caterpillars and the chrysalis all over your yard if you have kids or grandkids um you can really get them interested in the natural world from a young age by um you know showing them these things so to start we're going to go into swallowtail butterflies and a lot of people see these they're easily recognizable because they're large colorful butterflies with these four, I'm sorry, four tined wings. Um, and they also have large showy caterpillars as well. And you can see in the bottom right corner, um, when these caterpillars are in their um, final stages of life, they can actually produce these little horn-like structures from their head that are called osmaterium. And um, they kind of let off a foul little stench to warn predators not to mess with them. So um, you might have seen some of these caterpillars crawling around your yard before. So 
they're not pests, you know, they, they are actually big, beautiful butterflies. So you can, if, you know, if you see them chewing up your plants a little bit, you can, you know, grab some of the leaves and put them maybe in a little butterfly container and let those butterflies grow up and, you know, let them hatch. And you can, it's like a little science experiment for yourself, right? And you can save your plants at the same time. So there's about 10 or so species here in South Florida, um, but we're going to go ahead and get into the more common species you're very likely to see. And we're going to start first with this big, beautiful, showy black swallowtail. And um, you guys may have seen this, encountered this in your yard, if you've ever um, maybe had a cultivated herb garden, because these guys actually like to host on um, species of carrot family plants. So things like dill and fennel and parsley, even uh, obviously carrots, these guys will like to host on. Um, so they have this big showy um, orange and uh, blue scaling on their upper hind wing. You can see there I have it circled. And um, underneath their wing, they have this kind of brilliant streak of orange and blue scaling as well on the underside hind wing. Uh, very large and showy butterfly. Um, it could get maybe confused with a couple other species, but um, the uh, other species that look similar to it lack that black centered um, hind wing with the, the, the spot on the hind wing with the black center spot. And um, the, the other butterfly that closely resembles it lacks all the um, extensive yellow marking, which is the pipe vine swallowtail, which is another beautiful one that we're not going to get to today, but um, maybe you can do some further research yourself. So the, as you can see here in the top right corner, the, but, uh, the caterpillars of this species are, are brilliant. Um, lime green larvae with uh, black stripes with these little um, yellow spots embroidered inside of them. And uh, so if you've ever maybe had some fennel or some dill in your garden, you might have seen one of these guys chomping at your plant a little bit, and maybe thought it was a pest and maybe wanted to spray some kind of pesticide. But um, this is a nice segue to just tell you about what our, another thing our program does. We actually um, help identify pests and also plants and other things in the, in, the, um, in the garden that you might encounter. So if you see a creepy crawly caterpillar walking around on some of your plants, you can send us a picture and we can tell you if it, if it actually is a nuisance pest or if it's you know, a beneficial um, butterfly instead or some other kind of beneficial insect. So you know whether or not you wanna deal with it. Um, so that's a free service we offer and it'll help you maybe save some money and some, uh, some headache in your garden. You know, instead of applying these harsh chemicals, you can find out the best way to deal with some of these issues. So that's the black swallowtail. Um, as I said, they will host on um, cultivated members of the carrot family, like um, dill, fennel, uh, parsley. So uh, if you would like to attract this butterfly to your yard, uh, you want to plant those things. Host plants are literally the plants that butterflies like to host their larvae on. So they'll lay their eggs on the plants and their caterpillars will eat the plants. They won't just go laying their eggs on any plant. The caterpillars won't just eat any plant. Every butterfly has a very specific um, type of plant it wants to attract to uh, and it, want, it wants to lay its eggs on. So if you want to attract the most species of butterflies, the idea is to plant a wide variety of host plants to get the um, most species possible. So now we're getting into the giant swallowtail. This is a big, brilliant butterfly and it is actually the largest butterfly in, uh, in Florida, actually, believe it or not. Um, it has this beautiful, um, you, you can see the kind of similar yellow banding on the upper wing. It doesn't have the eye spot, like I mentioned. And you can see the, uh, this is a distinctive feature of the giant swallowtail. You can see the hind wing tail, you can say, has a kind of little um, spot in it, a, a kind of cream colored spot, which is unique for this butterfly. Um, and if you need another telltale sign of it, you, you can see the cream colored underside. Um, and I, I say telltale sign with a little asterisk because there are actually a few um, endangered species or introduced species of butterflies that resemble the giant swallowtail as well, which are the Shouse's swallowtail and the Bahamian swallowtail, which is obviously introduced due to the, uh, you can guess by the name. But um, if you're seeing this butterfly with the cream color underside, I'll say, nine times out of 10, it's most likely the giant swallowtail. And the reason is, is because it actually likes to host on um, species of citrus family plants. Um, we actually have a couple of native plants you could plant to attract this butterfly, like our, our Florida native wild lime. Um, now don't get excited, it doesn't produce an edible lime, but it is a great pollinator plant, uh, be warned. It does have some kind of nasty thorns, but it is a beautiful tree. Uh, it likes to kind of be in a, I've noticed it kind of prefers almost a sort of hammocky area. It doesn't like to be really in full sun. The one growing in my yard that's in a kind of hammock grows much better than the one I've got in the full sun at the, at the extension office. Um, 
But as you can see, this caterpillar actually, its defense ne mechanism is it wants to resemble bird poop. So sometimes I like to show it to the kids and call it the bird poop caterpillar. So you can sometimes, if you have a citrus tree in your backyard, um, you can maybe see a, a piece of bird poop moving around in the leaves and it might actually be this giant swallowtail um, caterpillar. Uh, so, you know, actually Miami-Dade and, and actually in Coral Gables where I live was once, you know, extensive citrus groves. So this butterfly is all over South Florida. And I guarantee you guys, if you plant a citrus tree of some kind, especially our wild lime, which is its preferred larval host, um, it will definitely come to your yard and you'll see the caterpillars and the butterflies. Big, beautiful, showy butterfly. And this is the last swallowtail we're going to talk about tonight. This is the uh, polydomus. Like I mentioned, there's many other butterfly uh, swallowtail species in South Florida. Um, these are the ones I'd say you're probably most likely to see. Um, but you can do your own research and learn about all the others. Um, they are a very fun species of butterfly. The polydomus, uh, as you can tell, is actually the most kind of unmarked of all the swallowtails. And for that reason, it's pretty distinctive. Um, if you need some other distinctive features, it actually doesn't really have a swallow tail. You can see it has the ribbing on its hind wings, but it actually doesn't have the tail that, say, the giant swallowtail there has. Um, it has an absence of a tail. It's also sometimes called the golden rimmed swallowtail because, as you can see above on the swallowtail uh, on the upper wing, it has um, a, a golden rim kind of on the outside edge of the, both the forewing and the hind wing, which is unique for that butterfly to have no other markings besides that. <clears throat> and then its host plant is a really beautiful uh, type of plant called a, a pipe vine, a, a Dutchman pipe vine. Uh, there are several species that will do good here in South Florida. Um, do a little research. You don't want to get an invasive one. Some of them will do a little too well um, <laughs> because they're actually tropical species and Miami is obviously subtropical. Our Florida native pipe vine is the Aristolochia tomentosa, which is the woolly pipe vine. Unfortunately, it doesn't grow too well here in South Florida. It will grow, but just very, very slowly. Um, I've selected for my garden the giant pipe vine, which you can see here on the right side. Um, but there are better selections than the giant pipe vine. So like I said, do a little research because there's actually another swallowtail called the spice bush swallow, or sorry, the, um, the pipe vine swallowtail, which is another one I alluded to earlier. Big, beautiful, iridescent blue butterfly. Um, and it will actually lay on these pipe vines as well, but these um, tropical species of pipe vine, like the one that I have, unfortunately, is too toxic for the pipe vine swallowtail. Um, so I, I just mentioned this plant is toxic. So be aware if you have maybe pets that like to gnaw on plants, this might not be a good selection for you. But as you can see, they are big, beautiful, showy flowers. Um, I also will give another beware that the flowers can sometimes resemble um, kind of like a rotting smell, but um, they are quite beautiful. So if you have the space, it can climb into a tree canopy and it can be a quite beautiful plant. <clears throat> so now we're going on to our next family of butterflies, which are known as the sulfurs, the whites, and the yellows. And this is a very extensive family of butterflies. They're usually small or medium size, orange, yellow, and or white with uh, black markings. And uh, this is a pretty cool family of butterflies because they actually exhibit something called puddling, which is where sometimes um, and especially in our rainy season, these butterflies can sometimes be seen sipping up, um, you know, a, a, from a mud source on the floor instead of nectaring on a flower. And this is to get nutrients like sulfur out of the soil, which is where they get their name sulfur butterflies from, and probably where they get their yellow coloring from as well. And they're also getting uh, amino acids out of these mud puddles, which, you know, uh, help them burn energy and um, build proteins and things like that. So the barred yellow is a butterfly I guarantee you, all you guys have in your yard somewhere or in your neighborhood. Um, this is a nice little tiny butterfly and it actually has a little bit of seasonal variability. So um, more often in Miami, I will say you kind of see them more of a whiter color and that's because in the hotter months, they actually get more of a white color um, on the outside of their wings. And actually in, in the colder months, they, you will see them a little bit more yellow on the outside. But like I said, here in Miami where it's nice and hot, they mostly stay white. But when they open their wings up, um, you, you won't really see them opening their wings up on a flower, but as they're flapping their wings um, you know, rapidly in flight, you will be able to make out this black bar um, very easily. You'll be able to see it because their wings are moving so fast. You'll be able to see these two black bars on their wings, and that's where they get their name barred sulfur from. So a nice tiny little butterfly. And like I said, all you guys will have this butterfly in your landscape because it hosts on a couple of um, weedy plants that uh, most people 
don't really give credit to. Uh, the one here on the right side is its preferred larval host, which is point vetch. Um, we have a couple species of these that can grow in the landscapes. Um, and I'm sure all you guys have had, if you look in the right side picture, those little seed pods stuck to your socks or your shoelaces at some point. Um, and you, you may have thought they're pretty annoying at the time, but actually it's a very good pollinator plant. Uh, actually many species of butterflies, um, a couple species of sulfurs and a couple of skippers, which we're not gonna get to tonight, will lay their eggs on this as well. And um, the barred yellow will also lay their eggs on another type of uh, weedy little flower. Um, doesn't get as much hate because it doesn't really make an annoying little seed is the pencil flower, also sometimes called cheesy toes. Um, so as you can see, some of these little weedy plants in our landscapes that sometimes you maybe want to, you know, dump some insectis or dump some, uh, you know, herbicide on or rip out. If you can maintain a nice little patch of them, they can actually be benefiting our local wildlife. And you might be able to see a little tiny caterpillar crawling on them or a little tiny egg. I've actually seen one lay an egg um, before on a, a, a different type of butterfly, but a little tiny egg. It's really cool to see. So uh, the next one we're going to get to is the cloudless sulfur. This one's a, a medium-sized butterfly, mostly unmarked, uh, kind of this lemon yellow color. Um, and the women, uh, the, sorry, the female butterflies actually have a kind of black scalloped border on their um, upper on their upper side wing. You can see there in the bottom picture, which will help you make out a female. So if you um, maybe see this all yellow butterfly hovering around some of the host plants I'm about to mention with this kind of black scallop border on the wing, you might want to stick around and uh, watch it for a little bit because it might be about to lay some eggs, which is really cool to see if you've never seen a butterfly lay some eggs. Um, so they actually lay some eggs on some really nice ornamental plants that grow really well here in our South Florida environment. Um, partridge pea, uh, sensitive pea, sickle pod senna, Christmas senna, all these things are um, in the Fabaceae family uh, of plants which is a great family of plants because they actually, many of them about, I think 90% of the family of the plants in this family actually fix nitrogen naturally into your soil. So if you, any of you guys know, nitrogen is the first ingredient that is a, and, and primary ingredient in many um, brands of fertilizer that you'll buy because you know nitrogen actually helps plants to grow. It helps them grow their, their leafy greens and their, their leaves and things like that. Um, it's the major nutrient involved in that. So if you have a plant naturally fixing nitrogen into your soil, you don't have to go out and buy these fertilizers that can leach into our aquifer and get into our bay and cause all kinds of environmental problems. So that's a little um, UF IFAS extension landscape hack. If you plant some things like um, maybe some sunshine mimosa or some perennial peanut uh, ground covers, you can fix nitrogen naturally into your soil. And some of these butterflies will be laying caterpillars on them as well. Uh, the, the pea family, the Fabaceae family of plants, uh, many of these plants um, actually serve host to butterflies. So they're great selections for the landscape, especially our natives like partridge pea. If you guys would like to know where to buy um, Florida native plants, you can send me an email. Uh, you'll see my email at the end of this presentation, and I can send you a list of Florida native landscapes here in Miami-Dade County. And the last one we're going to talk about quickly is the uh, Great Southern White. And uh, this is a very distinctive all-white butterfly. The females can actually sometimes have this kind of blue-gray variants. Um, so sometimes you can actually see them kind of be this mottled grayish blue color, which is really beautiful to see. But the other distinctive feature of this butterfly is they have these sky blue antenna tips, which you can see circled in the top right corner, which is a lot of fun to see. A uh, really, really beautiful little butterfly. And these guys host on another little uh, weedy species of, of uh, plant, which you can find maybe on a roadside somewhere, especially down in the Redlands, you can find this growing on the roadside. Not so much around this time of year. They're starting to die out a little bit. I've got some in my garden and they're starting to die out, but it grow, it hosts on something called Virginia peppergrass, which is also another another common name for this plant is actually um, poor man's pepper because apparently the, uh, the seeds of this plant can be used as a substitution for black pepper. Um, I've never done it and I wouldn't recommend doing it if you don't know you know, any insecticide or herbicide has been applied on them. But maybe if you have a natural native organic garden at your at your house and you seed some of this in your garden, I guarantee you it'll grow. And um, you might get these beautiful white butterflies in your garden and you could even use the seed for um, some pepper substitution. But be careful harvesting the seed because I've accidentally killed one or two little caterpillars trying to wipe my fingers up the plant and harvest the seed. And I felt really bad about it. So you will get the caterpillars, but be, be careful harvesting the seed. <laughs> um, we're going to quickly talk about another family of butterflies called the blues. 
Um, I'm only going to get into one today, but there's actually about five or so species here in South Florida, including our endangered Miami blue butterfly. Um, so do, do a little research on that if you'd like. Um, another really fun one you can see is in the bottom right corner I won't talk too much about today. That's the eastern pygmy blue. If you're blessed enough to, you know, live on a, a coast near a coastal environment, um, you might be blessed to see this butterfly. It's actually the smallest butterfly in Florida. So I showed you the largest. This is the smallest. Um, it can actually fit on the, the nail of your pinky finger, tiny little brilliant butterfly. And I like to talk about the blues because um, these are su such small butterflies. But once you, you know, get, if you get to observe them up close, they're almost ethereal looking. They're so um, intensely marked. They have these kind of iridescent blue eye spots or silver eye spots like you saw in the last one. But uh, this butterfly here, the Cassius blue, um, has these brilliant blue eye spots. You can see two of them there on the out on, on the underside of the wing when it has its wings closed. And they're capped in a little bit of orange. So go Gators. That's a nice little gator butterfly right there. But um, I, you guys probably see this one in your landscape as well. Um, there is another that lo looks a lot like it called the Serranus blue. Um, but it has one eye spot instead of two. So that's the easiest way to tell it apart. Um, if you see two eye spots, you know it's the Cassius. And uh, it lays its egg on this beautiful um, tree that goes great in our South Florida landscape called the wild tamarind. Um, and I see it landscape all the time in like parking lots and medians and schools and, you know, just byways and things like that. A nice little beautiful tree with this uh, nice little whimsical puffy white flower that you see down there. And um, if you know, if, uh, Barbara told me once and I've checked it out and I, I, I it's awesome to see if, you know, the, uh, the sun setting behind one of these trees, you can just kind of see um, a cloud of these Cassius blue butterflies kind of just shrouding the tree because we've got two at our landscape. And this is probably one of the most common butterflies I see when I'm at work is this Cassius blue right here. So nice little tiny, tiny little butterfly. But um, if, you get, uh, if you get to see it land um, or get maybe a pair of binoculars or a nice zoom lens on a camera, you can get a nice photo and see how brilliant they are. All right, so on to um, some of everyone's favorites. We're going to get into the Heliconians, better known as the long wings. Um, and these guys are characterized by their, just as the name says, their long wings. Um, and all these other butterflies I've shown you so far, they've kind of made it um, difficult on us. They've, you know, hosted on a wide variety of plants. But these Heliconians like to make it nice and simple here in South Florida for us. And they actually all will host on species of passion flower vine. Now, there is one. It will host on passion flower vine occasionally, but it actually prefers to host on um, species of of uh, violets, but I've only seen maybe two or three since my whole time being here in South Florida. So for that reason, I didn't include them. But if you'd like, look up the variegated fritillary when you have some time or it's a beautiful camouflage looking butterfly. But this is actually considered one of the most um, beautiful butterflies in the world. I just recently took a trip to North Carolina and um, it's a seasonal butterfly there. We get a year round here and um, it's one of their most revered butterflies, this Gulf fritillary. And it's one of my favorite butterflies as well. Um, distinctive silvery spots on the underside wing. Um, you can see above in the bottom right corner, that's the above side of the, of the butterfly. Um, some, some people ask me sometimes that this is actually a monarch when they're seeing this in their landscape. But once this butterfly lifts its wings up, you can see that kind of brown with the long elongated silver spots on them. And the body, I want you to, I want to point out the body to you actually has a uh, orange and white stripes which is um, distinctive from the monarch, which has a black body with um, white spots on it. So um, if you're seeing that and compared with that little beautiful salmon to orange to brown gradient on the upper wing there, um, it's a distinctive butterfly. One of my favorites to see. And like I mentioned, it will be laying its eggs on species of passion flowers. So there are multitudes of passion flowers we can grow in our landscape, but um, I will definitely recommend our Florida native passion flower, which uh, we have a few of those as well, but the one they prefer to lay their eggs on is our corky stem passion flower, which is actually, uh, you might even be able to find one of these growing underneath some of your shrubs in your landscape where maybe some birds are likely to be hanging out um, because the birds love the berries of this little um, vining plant as well. So I've actually got a couple in my garden and uh, they're trellising up a tomato tower. Um, I've actually seen one at a um, master gardener's house. I, I think I actually saw her join in Vilma and I swear she had the biggest passion flower I've ever seen in my life. The stem, I could barely even fit my hand around. It was gigantic. So these things can be long lived if you let them and they will attract multitudes of butterflies, about uh, three or four different species, depending um, on what's in your area. So this is the Gulf fritillary caterpillar. You can see it's basically all orange with black spikes. Sometimes you might see them with a couple uh, 
like a brown stripes going down, kind of breaking up that orange, but usually they'll be all orange. Um, and the spikes don't hurt, so don't think they sting. If you see this on your plants, you can handle the, I, I don't recommend handling them, but you could if you needed to, maybe if it had fallen off the plant or something. Um, but like I said, don't, don't go handling them if you don't have to. Um, now we're getting into the next one, which is the Julia heliconian and uh, Julia longwing. This is a pretty distinct butterfly. It's all orange. So, um, and it kind of has this mottled yellow orangey pattern underneath its wing. But if you're seeing an unmarked orange butterfly in your landscape with these elongated wings, it's um, going to be this Julia longwing. And this one is actually another butterfly that's really easy to tell the female of the species because the females will actually have this little bit of black um, capping and markings on their on their um, upper wing. So if you see one of these orange butterflies and you have some passion flower in your landscape and you see it has that black marking on its wing, I, I, I recommend you kind of wait and watch it because you'll probably see it lay some eggs on your passion flower. And their caterpillars are crazy looking. Um, you see they kind of generally have the same look of the of the uh, Gulf fritillary, but they have this crazy kind of orange, uh, maroony, pinkish, um, intermittent pattern scattered about with some white. And uh, like I said, they will also be laying spe on the species of passion flowers. So that's the uh, that's the corky stem passion flower there in the bottom right corner, Passiflora suberosa. It makes a little tiny inconspicuous white flower. Um, normally these passion flowers make big showy flowers. Um, this one won't do that for you, but um, like I said, nine, if you if you plant that next to a, maybe a big showy passion flower, nine times out of 10, our native species will be laying on the corky stem over the other species of passion flower. Um, so then we get to our last one we're going to talk about today, which is our, our, actually our Florida state butterfly, another really distinctive one, which is the zebra heliconian, zebra longwing. And these guys are aptly named for their kind of zebra stripes they have on their wings there. And uh, if you need another identifying factor, you can look for these kind of red spots that are kind of on the base of their wings above and below. So um, if the big, you know, white and black stripes aren't enough to cue you off there. And they have another caterpillar that closely resembles the other two we just talked about, except it's all white. And um, I want you to look also at the chrysalis here in the upper right corner. Um, if some of you guys have uh, butterfly gardens at your house, you know that monarchs have uh, like a little bit of gold capping on their chrysalis and also the queens do as well. And these zebras actually have a little bit of silver capping on the inside of their, of their chrysalis, really pretty to see. So I just like to see those kind of metallic colors. It's pretty crazy how they can form those. So we're going to real quickly brush over the crescents. Um, these are usually small brown or orange butterflies uh, with varying markings, usually black. Um, and they, they have a, a, a kind of a wide variety of host plants as well. But I'm going to talk about the Phaon crescent because it gives me a nice little segue um, into talking about a really special plant that we all have growing in our landscapes. And maybe you guys after this talk, maybe tomorrow you guys can uh, go out and scout out some of this in your landscape and maybe try and grow some. Uh, but these these are some nice, beautiful little butterflies, this kind of a uh, intermittent cream pattern below uh, that you can see there kind of scattered about with uh, streaks of this kind of maroonish red or rusty brown color and black. And this is a pretty distinctive butterfly. There's an, another butterfly called the Cuban crescent that can sometimes get confused with this, but you're most likely seeing this Phaon crescent in your landscape because its host plant grows everywhere throughout Miami-Dade County. And uh, it's in the bottom right corner here, and you may have seen it growing in your landscape at some time. It is this awesome plant called frog fruit. Uh, it's also sometimes called turkey tangle. Um, match head is another common name for it. But if you like the scientific name, it's uh, phyla notiflora. Um, I can send that to you uh, in, in a follow-up email after this. But um, this is a nice, beautiful little ground cover plant that um, grows you know, basically in all of our landscapes. You guys might have seen this popping up in your grass. It makes a nice little beautiful um, white, or yeah, you can see a little white flower there that resembles a match head when it's not in bloom, which is where it gets one of its common names from. And uh, this is actually in the lantana family. So you can see actually the flowers look like small little lantana buds, which is uh, pretty unique. And um, so a nice little plant. You guys can go out and scout in your grass for this, uh, these little flowers, and you can actually rip a little piece of it out and throw it in a pot. And if it gets in some deep soil, it will actually start sprawling over the edge of these pots and be a nice, beautiful little potted plant if you like. Or you could even, I've seen people replace the grass in the yard with this plant. Um, I've certified another master gardener's house named Kurt, and he um, has this just all throughout his yard. Um, and I, I swear to you, when, when I was certifying his yard as a Florida native landscape, uh, 
I, I promise you there was about a thousand white peacock butterflies flying all about, which is another butterfly that hosts on this plant as well. So um, this, this plant alone hosts three different species of butterflies here in South Florida, this Fayon Crescent, the white peacock, which we're gonna talk about next. And, um, oh, the last one, is, oh, the, the, uh, the buckeye is the other one that will host on it as well. I, I haven't seen many buckeyes here in South Florida. So I don't talk about them, but I've actually had them pictured here just because I knew I'd mention them because it's one of the hosts. We do have two species of buckeyes, maybe even three. It's kind of um, argued a little bit. Um, the tropical buckeye, the common buckeye, and the mangrove buckeye, um, how common some of these species are. But we definitely do have the, uh, the, the mangrove buckeye here in South Florida. And um, as you can see, they're pretty distinctive, uh, beautiful, iridescent sometimes butterflies in the case of the, uh, the tropical buckeye there on the left side. The mangrove buckeye is the one on the right, the little green one. It's more more green and more muted colors. But um, we're here to talk about today the uh, the the white peacock, which is this beautiful um, brown and orange and white butterfly with some kind of you know black eye spots. And if you see it lift its wings up, it's one of the only butterflies that we'll see that has actually some kind of pinkish markings on it, which is uh, pretty cool to see as well. Um, so it's one of my favorite butterflies. And like I mentioned, it hosts on um, uh, the the matchhead plant the frog fruit, as well as um, kind of an aquatic edge plant known as a uh, herb of grace or water hyssop, uh, Bacopa monori, which is another great maybe uh, so ground cover selection if maybe you have an aquatic edge in your landscape or maybe you have a spot in your yard that's always flooding with water and the grass won't grow there. Well, quit trying to plant grass and maybe grow a Florida native aquatic edge ground cover like uh, herb of grace that can you know serve a benefit to some of these butterflies and stop dealing with problems that you don't need to deal with. And, uh, you know, if you contact us at UF IFAS Extension, we can give you a whole list of um, plant recommendations for your yard as well, as well as uh, local plant nurseries where you can procure those plants. All right, so we're going to get now into uh, everyone's favorite family of butterflies. This is the last family we're going to talk about, um, which is the, the monarch family, also known as the uh, milkweed butterflies. Um, so I haven't really seen any soldiers here in South Florida, um, but we definitely do get the queens and the monarchs. Um, which are not the same butterfly. Uh, some people, there's some confusion over this. They're they're not all the same. Uh, they look so similar because they get their markings from uh, ingesting this milkweed sap, which are their host plants. So many people like to plant milkweeds in their landscape for monarchs because uh, many people know that monarchs like to host on the milkweed family of plants, as you can see there on the top line. Um, but we're going to go back real quick just so I can give you some identifying factors because. Uh, there, there's some people that say that we have um, viceroys is here as well, which is a mom monarch mimic butterfly. And I just want I want to give you guys a couple um, identifying factors to help you identify this against the queen as well as against the viceroy. Um, so the monarch will have um, this unbroken back wing, back hind wing. You can see in the bottom right side picture, um, all the lines kind of run down the wing. The viceroy, which is the one that mimics the monarch, it will actually have a line that intersects those perpendicularly going across on the backside wing. Um, so if you see a small looking monarch and you see the back hind wing has a broken black line going through it, you know it's the monarch mimic, which is a butterfly called the viceroy. Um, the other way you can tell this butterfly apart is it has uh, on the upper side um, or on the underside of the wing, which you can see on the top side of the slide here, um, it kind of has a, a lighter, hind wing, then it does um, four wing. You can see the four wings a little bit darker orange, whereas the hind wings a little bit lighter. And it also, uh, and one more identifying factor, that's not enough for you. The viceroy has three rows of spots in its outer wing margin. You can see those white spots on the outside of the wing. You can see the monarch only has two rows of dots. Uh, if you see a butterfly that looks like the monarch and it has three rows of dots paired with that broken black dash going over the hind wing, you know it's the viceroy, not the monarch. Anyway. Uh, these are some awesome butterflies, and this is another one where you can actually tell the male apart from the female. Um, the males will actually have this small little black dot on their hind wing. You can see it on the small picture on the on the left side there. Um, there's a small black dot, and that's actually a scent gland that the males use to attract a, a female mate. Um, and as I mentioned, once they attract that mate, they will go laying those eggs on your milkweed um, plant. So we have several milkweeds that will grow well here in South Florida. Um, I'm going to give you guys a word of caution about going to, you know, these big box stores and buying um, tropical milkweed, which is, I, I should have included a picture. It's the one with uh, the red and the yellow flowers that you usually see when you go to these big box stores. Um, 
this plant can actually harbor a really harmful um, bacteria that can interrupt the, the monarch's development cycle when they're trying to turn into butterflies and their wings can actually come out crumpled. It's a bacteria known as OE. So only the tropical milkweed will harbor this bacteria. So if it's not a native milkweed either. So if you're buying milkweed from a native uh, plant nursery, um, you know you're not gonna have this problem. But actually I'm gonna recommend uh, a non-native Florida friendly species of milkweed to you just because um, our native species of milkweed, they don't really grow too well here in South Florida. Um, and they, they grow very slowly and they can really only support a couple of, butter, uh, a couple of caterpillars at a time, maybe one or two. Um, if you get the giant milkweed, um, I forget the scientific name, it's eluding me right now, but I'll send it to you in the follow-up email. Um, the giant milkweed can host basically a whole colony of these butterflies. So it's a great selection for a, a nice host plant for these butterflies. You can have one shrub of this milkweed in your yard and have all kinds of butterfly caterpillar and larvae all over them. And that's really fun to see. Monarch caterpillars are some of people's favorites as well as the chrysalis I mentioned earlier. They kind of have this gold capping uh, kind of rimming the outer rim there. And as you can see in the upper right corner, which is really beautiful to see. Um, so the the monarch, as I mentioned earlier, closely resembles the queen butterfly, uh, which I'll give you a couple identifying factors against each other uh, if, if uh, maybe you aren't seeing the differences already. But also I want to point out to you that the monarch caterpillar, you can see there above, closely resembles as well the queen caterpillar. So I mentioned both of these butterflies will lay eggs on species of milkweed plants. So just because you see these black and yellow caterpillars on your plant might not mean you have a monarch. And the way to tell it apart is you can see here the uh, the monarch has two sets of horns, I guess you can call them, one on the head and one on the on the posterior end, whereas the queen has three sets of horns, one on the head, one kind of on the uh, upper quarter of the body, and then one on the posterior end. So if you're seeing three sets of horns, um, you know it's a queen butterfly instead of a instead of a monarch butterfly larvae, which is really fun. They have different patterns as well. I'll go back one more time so you can see the differing patterns. But the easiest way to tell them apart is the horns. And um, the, the chrysalis there is kind of off leading bec uh, uh, because, or misleading because uh, the queens actually have a greenish kind of chrysalis as well. This one's about to hatch. Um, but these guys will, as I mentioned, be laying eggs on species of milkweed. So the monarch, the milkweed butterflies make it easy on us as well. We All we gotta do is plant species of milkweed. Like I mentioned, be cautious about the tropical milkweed. And then um, I'm very quickly just going to mention uh, our hair streak butterflies because there is one butterfly I do want to talk about. And it, and it is one you're very likely to see in your yard, the Atala hair streak. But I more so want to talk about it because it's really a good example of uh, conservation. You know, the, the, the topic of this um, of these talks is conservation conversation. So I mentioned earlier in our, my talk that uh, we're undergoing right now a pollinator apocalypse due to habitat fragmentation, degradation and climate change. And, um, you know, back in the 1970s, when Congress was enacting the Endangered Species Act, um, this butterfly right here was actually thought to be extinct. Um, it's, it's endemic to South Florida, I believe. Um, and at the time when they were making the act, it wasn't included on the endangered species list because it was thought to be extinct already. Um, you know, fast forward a couple years later, uh, a gentleman is, or I'm not, I'm not sure who's doing the research, but someone was doing some research out on Virginia Key here in South Florida, Miami-Dade County and they encountered an existing colony of this butterfly living on its host plant, which is the Kunti palm. You can see there in the bottom right corner. Um, so fast forward a couple more years, and you know people thought this was actually an attractive plant to be planting in their landscape. So a lot of people started planting this um, in medians on, on Miami Beach. You see it all over the place in the medians. And suddenly this butterfly that was once thought to be extinct, not even included on the endangered species list, because people started planting their host plant, uh, this butterfly actually made a complete comeback. So I don't even believe they're included on um, a species of concern list at this time um, because they basically made a full comeback because people are planting this Kunti palm, um, you know, in mass number in the landscape. I, I will say if you want to attract this butterfly to the landscape, it is a beautiful smaller butterfly, um, kind of iridescent above, um, orange tail with this beautiful sky blue scaling on the wing, um, you know, over that kind of black background, which is beautiful. And the caterpillars themselves look in it, it really insane as well with the uh, intense red with the yellow spots are really cool to see. Um, you need to plant a large patch of kunti to get them in your landscape. And kunti is a slow growing palm. So you really want to, you, you know, the more the merrier to kind of, uh, you know, relieve, I guess, the kunti, let it grow in and it won't, it won't become over encumbered by the caterpillar. But 
Um, it is a, a very special butterfly to be seeing, but it's a good, the Atala is a good representation of what conservation can do. If we all go out planting um, these pollinator host plants in our landscape, you know, we can help restore the, these pollinator numbers naturally to, to the wild. Um, so I do ask if you guys um, learned a lot today and you had a, um, a lot of fun learning, um, I will follow up with you with some information if you'd like, um, but I ask that you quickly fill out a super easy poll for me. Um, I'm going to go ahead and pull up a QR code for you. Uh, you just go ahead and scan that on your, oh, perfect. I think it's there in the uh, in the Zoom actually. So uh, if you feel like you've learned something today, uh, I, I really appreciate you guys coming. Um, I, I'm actually giving a, a longer, more intense version of this talk. Um, this is kind of the condensed version uh, for time management sake. Um, but on, on the 19th of November, which is actually um, the Sunday after next, I will be doing a guided butterfly tour at Elaine Gordon Enchanted Forest. We're going to be um, examining butterflies and we'll be talking about some other really fun species that I didn't really have the time to um, mention today. But um, yeah, we'll be catching and releasing butterflies and uh, examining them up close and it'll, it'll be a lot of fun. So if you want to learn a lot about, um, you know, identifying butterflies and, you know, in the landscape, it's a great, you know, practical way to do so. So that's going to be at Elaine Gordon Enchanted Forest on November 19th at noon. And if there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer them now. And once again, thank you all for coming again. I, ho I hope you all, I hope you all did learn something today.